Chapter Fifty Six of the Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Fifty Six. Andrea Cavalcanti. The Count of Monte Cristo entered the adjoining room which baptistin had designated as the drawing-room and found there a young man of graceful demeanour and elegant appearance who had arrived in a cab about half an hour previously baptistin had not found any difficulty in recognising the person who presented himself at the door for admittance he was certainly the tall young man with light hair red beard black eyes and brilliant complexion whom his master had so particularly described to him when the count entered the room the young man was carelessly stretched on a sofa tapping his boot with the gold-headed cane which he held in his hand on perceiving the count he rose quickly the count of monte cristo i believe said he yes sir and i think i have the honour of addressing count andrea cavalcanti count andrea cavalcanti repeated the young man accompanying his words with a bow you are charged with a letter of introduction addressed to me are you not said the count i did not mention that because the signature seemed to me so strange the letter signed sinbad the sailor is it not exactly so now as i have never known any sinbad with the exception of the one celebrated in the thousand and one nights well it is one of his descendants and a great friend of mine he is a very rich englishman eccentric almost to insanity and his real name is lord wilmore ah indeed then that explains everything that is extraordinary said andrea he is then the same englishman whom i met at uh yes indeed well monsieur i am at your service if what you say be true replied the count smiling perhaps you will be kind enough to give me some account of yourself and your family certainly i will do so said the young man with a quickness which gave proof of his ready invention i am as you have said the count andrea cavalcanti son of major bartolomo cavalcanti a descendant of the cavalcanti whose names are inscribed in the golden book at florence our family although still rich for my father's income amounts to half a million has experienced many misfortunes and i myself was at the age of five years taken away by the treachery of my tutor so that for fifteen years i have not seen the author of my existence since i have arrived at years of discretion and become my own master i have been constantly seeking him but all in vain at length i receive this letter from your friend who states that my father is in paris and authorizes me to address myself to you for information respecting him really all you have related to me is exceedingly interesting said monte cristo observing the young man with a gloomy satisfaction and you have done well to conform in everything to the wishes of my friend sinbad for your father is indeed here and is seeking you the count from the moment of first entering the drawing-room had not once lost sight of the expression of the young man's countenance he had admired the assurance of his look and the firmness of his voice but at these words so natural in themselves your father is indeed here and is seeking you young andrea started and exclaimed my father is my father here most undoubtedly replied monte cristo your father major bartolomeo cavalcanti the expression of terror which for the moment had overspread the features of the young man had now disappeared ah yes that is the name certainly major bartolomeo cavalcanti and you really mean to say monsieur that my dear father is here yes sir and i can even add that i have only just left his company the history which he related to me of his lost son touched me to the quick indeed his griefs hopes and fears on that subject might furnish material for a most touching and pathetic poem at length he one day received a letter stating that the abductors of his son now offered to restore him or at least to give notice where he might be found on condition of receiving a large sum of money by way of ransom your father did not hesitate an instant and the sum was sent to the frontier of piedmont with a passport signed for italy you were in the south of france i think yes replied andrea with an embarrassed air i was in the south of france a carriage was to await you at nice precisely so 
and it conveyed me from Nisi to Genoa, from Genoa to Turin, from Turin to Chambury, from Chambury to Pont de Beauvoisin, and from Pont de Beauvoisin to Paris. Indeed, then your father ought to have met you on the road, for it is exactly the same route which he himself took, and that is how we have been able to trace your journey to this place. But, said Andrea, if my father had met me, I doubt if he would have recognized me. I must be somewhat altered since he last saw me. Oh, the voice of nature, said Monte Cristo. True, interrupted the young man. I had not looked upon it in that light. Now, replied Monte Cristo, there is only one source of uneasiness left in your father's mind, which is this. He is anxious to know how you have been employed during your long absence from him how you have been treated by your persecutors, and if they have conducted themselves towards you with all the deference due to your rank. Finally, he is anxious to see if you have been fortunate enough to escape the bad moral influence to which you have been exposed, and which is infinitely more to be dreaded than any physical suffering. He wishes to discover if the fine abilities with which nature had endowed you have been weakened by want of culture, and, in short, whether you consider yourself capable of resuming and retaining in the world the high position to which your rank entitles you. Sir, exclaimed the young man, quite astounded, I hope no false report. As for myself, I first heard you spoken of by my friend Wilmore, the philanthropist. I believe he found you in some unpleasant position, but do not know of what nature, for I did not ask, not being inquisitive. Your misfortunes engaged his sympathies, so you see you must have been interesting. He told me that he was anxious to restore you to the position which you had lost, and that he would seek your father until he found him. He did seek, and has found him, apparently, since he is here now, and, finally, my friend apprised me of your coming, and gave me a few other instructions relative to your future fortune. I am quite aware that my friend Wilmore is peculiar, but he is sincere, and as rich as a gold mine, consequently, he may indulge his eccentricities without any fear of their ruining him, and I have promised to adhere to his instructions. Now, sir, pray do not be offended at the question I am about to put to you, as it comes in the way of my duty as your patron. I would wish to know if the misfortunes which happened to you, misfortunes entirely beyond your control, and which in no degree diminish my regard for you, I would wish to know if they have not, in some measure, contributed to render you a stranger to the world in which your fortune and your name entitle you to make a conspicuous figure. Sir, returned the young man, with a reassurance of manner, make your mind easy on this score. Those who took me from my father, and who always intended, sooner or later, to sell me again to my original proprietor, as they have now done, calculated that, in order to make the most of their bargain, it would be politic to leave me in possession of all my personal and hereditary worth, and even to increase the value, if possible. I have, therefore, received a very good education, and have been treated by these kidnappers very much as the slaves were treated in Asia Minor, whose masters made them grammarians, doctors, and philosophers, in order that they might fetch a higher price in the Roman market. Monte Cristo smiled with satisfaction. It appeared as if he had not expected so much from M. Andrea Cavacanti. Besides, continued the young man, if there did appear some defect in education, or offence against the established forms of etiquette, I suppose it would be excused, in consideration of the misfortunes which accompanied my birth, and followed me through my youth. Well, said Monte Cristo in an indifferent tone, you will do as you please, Count, for you are the master of your own actions and you are the person most concerned in the matter, but if I were you, I would not divulge a word of these adventures. Your history is quite a romance, and the world, which delights in romances and yellow covers, strangely mistrusts those who are bound in living parchment, even though they be gilded like yourself. This is the kind of difficulty which I wish to represent to you, my dear Count. You would hardly have recited your touching history before it would go forth to the world, and be deemed unlikely and unnatural. You would be no longer a lost child found, but you would be looked upon as an upstart, who had sprung up like a mushroom in the night. You might excite a little curiosity, but it is not every one who likes to be made the centre of observation and the subject of unpleasant remark. I agree with you, monsieur, 
said the young man turning pale and in spite of himself trembling beneath the scrutinizing look of his companion such consequences would be extremely unpleasant nevertheless you must not exaggerate the evil said monte cristo for by endeavouring to avoid one fault you will fall into another you must resolve upon one simple and single line of conduct and for a man of your intelligence this plan is as easy as it is necessary you must form honourable friendships and by that means counteract the prejudice which may attach to the obscurity of your former life andrea visibly changed countenance i would offer myself as your surety and friendly adviser said monte cristo did i not possess a moral distrust of my best friends and a sort of inclination to lead others to doubt them too therefore in departing from this rule i should as the actors say be playing a part quite out of my line and should therefore run the risk of being hissed which would be an act of folly however your excellency said andrea in consideration of lord wilmore by whom i was recommended to you yes certainly interrupted monte cristo but lord wilmore did not omit to inform me my dear monsieur andrea that the season of your youth was rather a stormy one ah said the count watching andrea's countenance i do not demand any confession from you it is precisely to avoid that necessity that your father was sent from lucca you shall soon see him he is a little stiff and pompous in his manner and he is disfigured by his uniform but when it becomes known that he has been for eighteen years in the austrian service all that will be pardoned we are not generally very severe with the austrians in short you will find your father a very presentable person i assure you ah sir you have given me great confidence it is so long since we were separated that i have not the least remembrance of him and besides you know that in the eyes of the world a large fortune covers all defects he is a millionaire his income is five hundred thousand francs then said the young man with anxiety i shall be sure to be placed in an agreeable position one of the most agreeable possible my dear sir he will allow you an income of fifty thousand livres per annum during the whole time of your stay in paris then in that case i shall always choose to remain there you cannot control circumstances my dear sir man proposes and god disposes andrea sighed but said he so long as i do remain in paris and nothing forces me to quit it do you mean to tell me that i may rely on receiving the sum you just now mentioned to me you may shall i receive it from my father asked andrea with some uneasiness yes you will receive it from your father personally but lord wilmore will be the security for the money he has at the request of your father opened an account of six thousand francs a month at monsieur danglars which is one of the safest banks in paris and does my father mean to remain long in paris asked andrea only a few days replied monte cristo his service does not allow him to be absent more than two or three weeks together ah my dear father exclaimed andrea evidently charmed with the idea of his speedy departure therefore said monte cristo feigning to mistake his meaning therefore i will not for another instant retard the pleasure of your meeting are you prepared to embrace your worthy father i hope you do not doubt it go then into the drawing-room my young friend where you will find your father awaiting you andrea made a low bow to the count and entered the adjoining room monte cristo watched him till he disappeared and then touched a spring in a panel made to look like a picture which in sliding partly from the frame discovered to view a small opening so cleverly contrived that it revealed all that was passing in the drawing-room now occupied by cavalcanti and andrea the young man closed the door behind him and advanced towards the major who had risen when he heard steps approaching him ah my dear father said andrea in a loud voice in order that the count might hear him in the next room is it really you how do you do my dear son said the major gravely after so many years of painful separation said andrea in the same tone of voice and glancing toward the door what a happiness it is to meet again indeed it is after so long a separation will you embrace me sir said andrea if you wish it my son said the major 
and the two men embraced each other after the fashion of actors on the stage that is to say each rested his head on the other's shoulder then we are once more reunited said andrea once more replied the major never more to be separated why as to that i think my dear son you must be by this time so accustomed to france as to look upon it almost as a second country the fact is said the young man that i should be exceedingly grieved to leave it as for me you must know i cannot possibly live out of lucca therefore i shall return to italy as soon as i can but before you leave france my dear father i hope you will put me in possession of the documents which will be necessary to prove my descent certainly i am come expressly on that account it has cost me much trouble to find you but i have resolved on giving them into your hands and if i had to recommence my search it would occupy all the few remaining years of my life where are these papers then here they are andrea seized the certificate of his father's marriage in his own baptismal register and after having opened them with all the eagerness which might be expected under the circumstances he read them with a facility which proved that he was accustomed to similar documents and with an expression which plainly denoted an unusual interest in the contents when he had perused the documents an indefinable expression of pleasure lighted up his countenance and looking at the major with a most peculiar smile he said in very excellent tuscan then there is no longer any such thing in italy as being condemned to the galleys the major drew himself up to his full height why what do you mean by that question i mean that if there were it would be impossible to draw up with impunity two such deeds as these in france my dear sir half such a piece of effrontery as that would cause you to be quickly dispatched to toulon for five years for change of air will you be good enough to explain your meaning said the major endeavouring as much as possible to assume an air of the great majesty my dear monsieur cavalcanti said andrea taking the major by the arm in a confidential manner how much are you paid for being my father the major was about to speak when andrea continued in a low voice nonsense i am going to set you an example of confidence they give me fifty thousand francs a year to be your son consequently you can understand that it is not at all likely i shall ever deny my parent the major looked anxiously around him make yourself easy we are quite alone said andrea besides we are conversing in italian well then replied the major they paid me fifty thousand francs down monsieur cavalcanti said andrea do you believe in fairy tales i used not to do so but i really feel now almost obliged to have faith in them you have then been induced to alter your opinion you have had some proofs of their truth the major drew from his pocket a handful of gold most palpable proofs said he as you may perceive you think then that i may rely on the count's promises certainly i do you are sure he will keep his word with me to the letter but at the same time remember we must continue to play our respective parts i as a tender father and i as a dutiful son as they choose that i shall be descended from you whom do you mean by they ma foi i can hardly tell but i was alluding to those who wrote the letter you received one did you not yes from whom from a certain abbe busoni have you any knowledge of him no i have never seen him what did he say in the letter you will promise not to betray me rest assured of that you well know that our interests are the same then read for yourself and the major gave a letter into the young man's hand andrea read in a low voice you are poor a miserable old age awaits you would you like to become rich or at least independent set out immediately for paris and demand of the count of monte cristo avenue de champs elysees number thirty the son whom you had by the marchesa corsinari and who was taken from you at five years of age this son is named andrea cavalcanti in order that you may not doubt the kind intention of the writer of this letter you will find enclosed an order for twenty-four hundred francs payable in florence at signor gozzi's 
also a letter of introduction to the count of monte cristo on whom i give you a draft of forty-eight thousand francs remember to go to the count on the twenty-sixth of may at seven o'clock in the evening signed abbe busoni it is the same what do you mean said the major i was going to say that i received a letter almost to the same effect you yes from the abbe busoni no from whom then from an englishman called lord wilmore who takes the name of sinbad the sailor and of whom you have no more knowledge than i of abbe busoni you are mistaken there i am ahead of you you have seen him then yes once where ah that is just what i cannot tell you if i did i should make you as wise as myself which it is not my intention to do and what did the letter contain read it you are poor and your future prospects are dark and gloomy do you wish for a name should you like to be rich and your own master ma foi said the young man was it possible there could be two answers to such a question take the post-chaise which you will find waiting at the porte de Gênes. as you enter nice pass through turin chambery and pont de Buvosen. go to the count of monte cristo avenue de champs elysees on the twenty sixth of may at seven o'clock in the evening and demand of him your father you are the son of marchese cavalcanti and the marchesa oliva corsonari the marquis will give you some papers which will clarify this fact and authorize you to appear under that name in the parisian world as to your rank an annual income of fifty thousand livres will enable you to support it admirably i enclose a draft of five thousand livres payable on monsieur ferrera bank at nice and also a letter of introduction to the count of monte cristo whom i have directed to supply all your wants sinbad the sailor huh said the major very good you have seen the count you say i have only just left him and has he conformed to all that the letter specified he has do you understand it not in the least there is a dupe somewhere at all events it is neither you nor i certainly not well then why it does not much concern us do you think it does no i agree with you there we must play the game to the end and consent to be blindfolded ah you shall see i promise you i will sustain my part to admiration i never once doubted your doing so monte cristo chose this moment for re-entering the drawing-room on hearing the sound of his footsteps the two men threw themselves in each other's arms and while they were in the midst of this embrace the count entered well marquis said monte cristo you appear to be in no way disappointed in the son whom your good fortune has restored to you ah your excellency i am overwhelmed with delight and what are your feelings said monte cristo turning to the young man as for me my heart is overflowing with happiness happy father happy son said the count there is only one thing which grieves me observed the major and that is the necessity for my leaving paris so soon ah my dear monsieur cavalcanti i trust you will not leave before i have had the honour of presenting you to some of my friends i am at your service sir replied the major now sir said monte cristo addressing andrea make your confession to whom tell monsieur cavalcanti something of the state of your finances ma foi monsieur you have touched upon a tender cord do you hear what he says major certainly i do but do you understand i do your son says he requires money well what would you have me do said the major you should furnish him with some of course replied monte cristo i yes you said the count at the same time advancing towards andrea and slipping a packet of bank-notes into the young man's hand what is this it is from your father from my father yes did you not tell him just now that you wanted money well then he deputes me to give you this am i to consider this as part of my income on account no it is for the first expenses of your settling in paris ah how good my dear father is silence said monte cristo he does not wish you to know that it comes from him i fully appreciate his delicacy said andrea 
cramming the notes hastily into his pocket. "'And now, gentlemen, I wish you good morning,' said Monte Cristo. "'And when shall we have the honour of seeing you again, Your Excellency?' asked Cavalcanti. "'Ah!' said Andrea. "'When may we hope for that pleasure?' "'On Saturday, if you will. Yes, let me see. Saturday. I am to dine at my country house, at Auteuil. On that day, Rue de la Fontaine, number 28. Several persons are invited, and among others, Monsieur Danglars, your banker. I will introduce you to him, for it will be necessary he should know you, as he is to pay your money. "'Full dress?' said the major, half out loud. "'Oh, yes, certainly,' said the Count. "'Uniform, cross, knee-breeches. "'And how shall I be dressed?' demanded Andrea. "'Oh, very simply. Black trousers, patent leather boots, white waistcoat, either a black or blue coat, and a long cravat. Go to Blin or Veronique for your clothes. Baptistin will tell you where, if you do not know their address. The less pretension there is in your attire, the better will be the effect, as you are a rich man. If you mean to buy any horses, get them of Davidus. And if you purchased a phaeton, go to Baptiste for it. At what hour shall we come? asked the young man. About half past six. We will be with you at that time, said the major. The two Cavalcanti bowed to the Count and left the house. Monte Cristo went to the window and saw them crossing the street arm in arm. There go two miscreants, said he. It is a pity they are not really related. Then, after an instant of gloomy reflection, Come, I will go to see the Morels, said he. I think that disgust is even more sickening than hatred. End of chapter 56 Recording by Robert Hoffman D7 of the Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 57 In the Lucerne Patch. Our readers must now allow us to transport them again to the enclosure surrounding Monsieur de Villefort's house and behind the gate half screened from view by the large chestnut trees which on all sides spread their luxuriant branches we shall find some people of our acquaintance this time maximilian was the first to arrive he was intently watching for a shadow to appear among the trees and waiting with anxiety the sound of a light step on the gravel walk at length the long-desired sound was heard and instead of one figure as he had expected he perceived that two were approaching him. The delay had been occasioned by a visit from Madame Danglars and Eugénie, which had been prolonged beyond the time at which Valentine was expected. That she might not appear to fail in her promise to Maximilian, she proposed to Mademoiselle Danglars that they should take a walk in the garden, being anxious to show that the delay, which was doubtless a cause of vexation to him, was not occasioned by any neglect on her part. The young man, with the intuitive perception of a lover, quickly understood the circumstances in which she was involuntarily placed, and he was comforted. Besides, although she avoided coming within speaking distance, Valentine arranged so that Maximilian could see her pass and repass, and each time she went by, she managed, unperceived by her companion, to cast an expressive look at the young man, which seemed to say, Have patience. You see, it is not my fault and Maximilian was patient, and employed himself in mentally contrasting the two girls, one fair with soft languishing eyes, a figure gracefully bending like a weeping willow, the other a brunette with a fierce and haughty expression, and as straight as a poplar. It is unnecessary to state that, in the eyes of the young man, Valentine did not suffer by the contrast. In about half an hour the girls went away, and Maximilian understood that Mademoiselle Danglars' visit had at last come to an end. In a few minutes Valentine re-entered the garden alone. For fear that anyone should be observing her return, she walked slowly, and instead of immediately directing her steps towards the gate, she seated herself on a bench, and carefully casting her eyes around, to convince herself that she was not watched, she presently arose and proceeded quickly to join Maximilian. 
good evening valentine said a well-known voice good evening maximilian i know i have kept you waiting but you saw the cause of my delay yes i recognized mademoiselle danglars i was not aware that you were so intimate with her who told you we were intimate maximilian no one but you appeared to be so from the manner in which you walked and talked together one would have thought you were two schoolgirls telling your secrets to each other we were having a confidential conversation returned valentine she was owning to me her repugnance to the marriage with m de morcerf and i on the other hand was confessing to her how wretched it made me to think of marrying m d'epinay dear valentine that will account to you for the unreserved manner which you observed between me and eugenie as in speaking of the man whom i could not love my thoughts involuntarily reverted to him on whom my affections were fixed ah how good you are to say so valentine you possess a quality which can never belong to mademoiselle danglars it is that indefinable charm which is to a woman what perfume is to the flower and flavor to the fruit for the beauty of either is not the only quality we seek it is your love which makes you look upon everything in that light no valentine i assure you such is not the case i was observing you both when you were walking in the garden and on my honour without at all wishing to deprecate the beauty of mademoiselle danglars i cannot understand how any man can really love her the fact is maximilian that i was there and my presence had the effect of rendering you unjust in your comparison no but tell me it is a question of simple curiosity and which was suggested by certain ideas passing in my mind relative to mademoiselle danglars i dare say it is something disparaging which you are going to say it only proves how little indulgence we may expect from your sex interrupted valentine you cannot at least deny that you are very harsh judges of each other if we are so it is because we generally judge under the influence of excitement but return to your question does mademoiselle danglars object to this marriage with m de morcerf on account of loving another i told you i was not on terms of strict intimacy with eugenie yes but girls tell each other secrets without being particularly intimate own now that you did question her on the subject ah i see you are smiling if you are already aware of the conversation that passed the wooden partition which interposed between us and you has proved but a slight security come what did she say she told me that she loved no one said valentine that she disliked the idea of being married that she would infinitely prefer leading an independent and unfettered life and that she almost wished her father might lose his fortune that she might become an artist like her friend mademoiselle louise d'armier ah you see well what does that prove asked valentine nothing replied maximilian then why did you smile why you know very well that you are reflecting on yourself valentine do you want me to go away ah uh, no no but do not let us lose time you are the subject on which i wish to speak true we must be quick for we have scarcely ten minutes more to pass together ma foi said maximilian in consternation yes you are right i am but a poor friend to you what a life i caused you to lead poor maximilian you who are formed for happiness i bitterly reproach myself i assure you well what does it signify valentine so long as i am satisfied and feel that even this long and painful suspense is amply repaid by five minutes of your society or two words from your lips and i have also a deep conviction that heaven would not have created two hearts harmonizing as ours do and almost miraculously brought us together to separate us at last those are kind and cheering words you must hope for us both maximilian that will make me at least partly happy but why must you leave me so soon i do not know particulars i can only tell you that madame de villefort sent to request my presence as she had a communication to make on which a part of my fortune depended let them take my fortune i am already too rich and perhaps when they have taken it they will leave me in peace and quietness you would love me as much if i were poor would you not maximilian 
Oh, I shall always love you. What should I care for either riches or poverty if my Valentine was near me, and I felt certain that no one could deprive me of her? But do you not fear that this communication may relate to your marriage? I do not think that is the case. However it may be, Valentine, you must not be alarmed. I assure you that as long as I live, I shall never love any one else. You think to reassure me when you say that, Maximilian. Pardon me, you are right, I am a brute. But I was going to tell you that I met Monsieur de Morcerf the other day. Well? Monsieur Franz is his friend, you know. What then? Monsieur de Morcerf has received a letter from Franz announcing his immediate return. Valentine turned pale and leaned her hand against the gate. Ah, heavens, if it were that! But no, the communication would not come through Madame de Villefort. Why not? Because I scarcely know why, but it has appeared as if Madame de Villefort secretly objected to the marriage, although she did not choose openly to oppose it. Is it so? Then I feel as if I could adore Madame de Villefort. Do not be in such a hurry to do that, said Valentine, with a sad smile. If she objects to your marrying Monsieur d'Epinay, she would be all the more likely to listen to any other proposition. No, Maximilian, it is not suitors to which Madame de Villefort objects. It is marriage itself. Marriage? If she dislikes that so much, why did she ever marry herself? You do not understand me, Maximilian. About a year ago I talked of retiring to a convent. Madame de Villefort, in spite of all the remarks which she considered it her duty to make, secretly approved of the proposition. My father consented to it at her instigation, and it was only on account of my poor grandfather that I finally abandoned the project. You can form no idea of the expression of that old man's eye when he looks at me, the only person in the world whom he loves, and, I had almost said, by whom he is beloved in return. When he learned of my resolution, I shall never forget the reproachful look which he cast on me, and the tears of utter despair which chased each other down his lifeless cheeks. Ah, Maximilian, I experienced at that moment such remorse for my intention, that throwing myself at his feet, I exclaimed, Forgive me, pray forgive me, my dear grandfather. They may do what they will with me. I will never leave you. When I had ceased speaking, he thankfully raised his eyes to heaven, but without uttering a word. Ah, Maximilian, I may have much to suffer, but I feel as if my grandfather's look at that moment would more than compensate for all. Dear Valentine, you are a perfect angel, and I am sure I do not know what I, sabring right and left among the Bedouins, can have done to merit your being revealed to me, unless, indeed, heaven took into consideration the fact that the victims of my sword were infidels. But tell me what interest Madame de Villefort can have in your remaining unmarried. Did I not tell you just now that I was rich, Maximilian? Too rich? I possess nearly fifty thousand livres in right of my mother. My grandfather and my grandmother, the Marquis and Marquesa de saint Meran, will leave me as much, and Monsieur Noirtier evidently intends making me his heir. My brother Edward, who inherits nothing from his mother, will, therefore, be poor in comparison with me. Now, if I had taken the veil, all this fortune would have descended to my father, and, in reversion, to his son. Ah, how strange it seems that such a young and beautiful woman should be so avaricious. It is not for herself that she is so, but for her son, and what you regard as a vice becomes almost a virtue when looked at in the light of maternal love. But could you not compromise matters and give up a portion of your fortune to her son? How could I make such a proposition, especially to a woman who always professes to be so entirely disinterested? Valentine, I have always regarded our love in the light of something sacred. Consequently, I have covered it with the veil of respect, and hid it in the innermost recesses of my soul. No human being, not even my sister, is aware of its existence. Valentine, will you permit me to make a confidant of a friend, and reveal to him the love I bear you? Valentine started. A friend, Maximilian? Who is this friend? I tremble to give my permission. 
listen valentine have you never experienced for any one that sudden and irresistible sympathy which made you feel as if the object of it had been your old and familiar friend though in reality it was the first time you had ever met nay further have you never endeavoured to recall the time place and circumstances of your former intercourse and failing in this attempt i almost believe that your spirits must have held converse with each other in some state of being anterior to the present and that you are only now occupied in a reminiscence of the past yes well that is precisely the feeling which i experienced when i first saw that extraordinary man extraordinary did you say yes you have known him for some time then scarcely longer than eight or ten days and do you call a man your friend whom you have only known for eight or ten days ah maximilian i had hoped you set a higher value on the title of friend your logic is most powerful valentine but say what you will i can never renounce the sentiment which has instinctively taken possession of my mind i feel as if it were ordained that this man should be associated with all the good which the future may have in store for me and sometimes it really seems as if his eye was able to see what was to come and his hand endowed with the power of directing events according to his own will he must be a prophet then said valentine smiling indeed said maximilian i have often been almost tempted to attribute to him the gift of prophecy at all events he has a wonderful power of foretelling any future good ah said valentine in a mournful tone do let me see this man maximilian he may tell me whether i shall ever be loved sufficiently to make amends for all i have suffered my poor girl you know him already i know him yes it was he who saved the life of your stepmother and her son the count of monte cristo the same ah cried valentine he is too much the friend of madame de villefort ever to be mine the friend of madame de villefort it cannot be surely valentine you are mistaken no indeed i am not for i assure you his power over our household is almost unlimited courted by my stepmother who regards him as the epitome of human wisdom admired by my father who says he has never before heard such sublime ideas so eloquently expressed idolized by edward who notwithstanding his fear of the count's large black eyes runs to meet him the moment he arrives and opens his hand in which he is sure to find some delightful present m de monte cristo appears to exert a mysterious and almost uncontrollable influence over all the members of our family if such be the case my dear valentine you must yourself have felt or at all events will soon feel the effects of his presence he meets albert de morcerf in italy it is to rescue him from the hands of the banditti he introduces himself to madame danglars it is that he may give her a royal present your stepmother and her son pass before his door it is that his nubian may save them from destruction this man evidently possesses the power of influencing events both as regards men and things i never saw more simple tastes united to greater magnificence his smile is so sweet when he addresses me that i forget it can ever be bitter to others ah valentine tell me if he ever looked on you with one of those sweet smiles if so depend on it you will be happy me said the young girl he never even glances at me on the contrary if i accidentally cross his path he appears rather to avoid me ah he is not generous neither does he possess that supernatural penetration which you attribute to him for if he did he would have perceived that i was unhappy and if he had been generous seeing me sad and solitary he would have used his influence to my advantage and since as you say he resembles the sun he would have warmed my heart with one of his life-giving rays you say he loves you maximilian how do you know that he does all would pay deference to an officer like you with a fierce moustache and a long sabre but they think they may crush a poor weeping girl with impunity ah valentine i assure you you are mistaken if it were otherwise if he treated me diplomatically that is to say like a man who wishes by some means or other to obtain a footing in the house so that he may ultimately gain the power of dictating to its occupants 
he would if it had been but once have honoured me with the smile which you extol so loudly but no he saw that i was unhappy he understood that i could be of no use to him and therefore paid no attention to me whatever who knows but what in order to please madame de villefort and my father he may not persecute me by every means in his power it is not just that he should despise me so without any reason ah forgive me said valentine perceiving the effect which her words were producing on maximilian i have done wrong for i have given utterance to thoughts concerning that man which i did not even know existed in my heart i do not deny the influence of which you speak or that i have not myself experienced it but with me it has been productive of evil rather than good well valentine said morrel with a sigh we will not discuss the matter further i will not make a confidant of him alas said valentine i see that i have given you pain i can only say how sincerely i ask pardon for having grieved you but indeed i am not prejudiced beyond the power of conviction tell me what this count of monte cristo has done for you i own that your question embarrasses me valentine for i cannot say that the count has rendered me any ostensible service still as i have already told you i have an instinctive affection for him the source of which i cannot explain to you has the sun done anything for me no he warms me with his rays and it is by his light that i see you nothing more has such and such a perfume done anything for me no its odour charms one of my senses that is all i can say when i am asked why i praise it my friendship for him is as strange and unaccountable as his for me a secret voice seems to whisper to me that there must be something more than chance in this unexpected reciprocity of friendship in his most simple actions as well as in his most secret thoughts i find a relation to my own you will perhaps smile at me when i tell you that ever since i have known this man i have involuntarily entertained the idea that all the good fortune which has befallen me originated from him however i have managed to live thirty years without his protection you will say but i will endeavour a little to illustrate my meaning he invited me to dine with him on saturday which was a very natural thing for him to do well what have i learned since that your mother and m de villefort are both coming to this dinner i shall meet them there and who knows what future advantages may result from the interview this may appear to you to be no unusual combination of circumstances nevertheless i perceive some hidden plot in the arrangement something in fact more than is apparent on a casual view of the subject i believe that this singular man who appears to fathom the motives of every one has purposely arranged for me to meet monsieur and madame de villefort and sometimes i confess i have gone so far as to try to read in his eyes whether he was in possession of the secret of our love my good friend said valentine i should take you for a visionary and should tremble for your reason if i were always to hear you talk in a strain similar to this is it possible that you can see anything more than the merest chance in this meeting pray reflect a little my father who never goes out has several times been on the point of refusing this invitation madame de villefort on the contrary is burning with the desire of seeing this extraordinary nabob in his own house therefore she has with great difficulty prevailed on my father to accompany her no no it is as i have said maximilian there is no one in the world of whom i can ask help but yourself and my grandfather who is little better than a corpse i see that you are right logically speaking said maximilian but the gentle voice which usually has such power over me fails to convince me to-day i feel the same as regards yourself said valentine and i own that if you have no stronger proof to give me i have another replied maximilian but i fear you will deem it even more absurd than the first so much the worse said valentine smiling it is nevertheless conclusive to my mind my ten years of service have also confirmed my ideas on the subject of sudden inspirations for i have several times owed my life to a mysterious impulse which directed me to move at once either to the right or to the left in order to escape the ball which killed the comrade fighting by my side while it left me unharmed dear maximilian why do you not attribute your escape to my constant prayers for your safety 
when you are away i no longer pray for myself but for you yes since you have known me said morrel smiling but that cannot apply to the time previous to our acquaintance valentine you are very provoking and will not give me credit for anything but let me hear this second proof which you yourself own to be absurd well look through this opening and you will see the beautiful new horse which i rode here ah what a beautiful creature cried valentine why did you not bring him close to the gate so that i could talk to him and pat him he is as you see a very valuable animal said maximilian you know that my means are limited and that i am what would be designated a man of moderate pretensions well i went to a horse dealer's where i saw this magnificent horse which i have named medea i asked the price they told me it was forty five hundred francs i was therefore obliged to give it up as you may imagine but i own i went away with a rather heavy heart for the horse had looked at me affectionately had rubbed his head against me and when i mounted him had pranced in the most delightful way imaginable so that i was altogether fascinated with him the same evening some friends of mine visited me m de chateau renaud m de bray and five or six other choice spirits whom you do not know even by name they proposed a game of bouillotte i never play for i am not rich enough to afford to lose or sufficiently poor to desire to gain but i was at my own house you understand so there was nothing to be done but to send for the cards which i did just as they were sitting down to table m de monte cristo arrived he took his seat amongst them they played and i won i am almost ashamed to say that my gains amounted to five thousand francs we separated at midnight i could not defer my pleasure so i took a cabriolet and drove to the horse-dealers feverish and excited i rang at the door the person who opened it must have taken me for a madman for i rushed at once to the stable medea was standing at the rack eating his hay i immediately put on the saddle and bridle to which operation he lent himself with the best grace possible then putting the forty-five hundred francs into the hands of the astonished dealer i proceeded to fulfil my intention of passing the night in riding in the champs elysees as i rode by the count's house i perceived a light in one of the windows and fancied i saw the shadow of his figure moving behind the curtain now valentine i firmly believe that he knew of my wish to possess this horse and that he lost expressly to give me the means of procuring him my dear maximilian you are really too fanciful you will not love even me long a man who accustoms himself to live in such a world of poetry and imagination must find far too little excitement in a common everyday sort of attachment such as ours but they are calling me do you hear ah valentine said maximilian give me but one finger through this opening in the grating one finger the tiniest finger of all that i may have the happiness of kissing it maximilian we said we would be to each other as two voices two shadows as you will valentine shall you be happy if i do what you wish oh yes valentine mounted on a bench and passed not only her finger but her whole hand through the opening maximilian uttered a cry of delight and springing forward seized the hand extended towards him and imprinted on it a fervent and impassioned kiss the little hand was then immediately withdrawn and the young man saw valentine hurrying toward the house as though she were almost terrified at her own sensations end of chapter fifty seven of the count of monte cristo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the count of monte cristo by alexander dumas chapter fifty eight monsieur noirtier de villefort we will now relate what was passing in the house of the king's attorney after the departure of madame danglars and her daughter and during the time of the conversation between maximilian and valentine which we have just detailed m de villefort entered his father's room followed by madame de villefort both of the visitors after saluting the old man 
and speaking to barois a faithful servant who had been twenty-five years in his service took their places on either side of the paralytic m noirtier was sitting in an armchair which moved upon casters in which he was wheeled into the room in the morning and in the same way drawn out again at night he was placed before a large glass which reflected the whole apartment and so without any attempt to move which would have been impossible he could see all who entered the room and everything which was going on around him m noirtier although almost as immovable as a corpse looked at the newcomers with a quick and intelligent expression perceiving at once by their ceremonious courtesy that they were come on business of an unexpected and official character sight and hearing were the only senses remaining and they like two solitary sparks remained to animate the miserable body which seemed fit for nothing but the grave it was only however by means of one of these senses that he could reveal the thoughts and feelings that still occupied his mind and the look by which he gave expression to his inner life was like the distant gleam of a candle which a traveller sees by night across some desert place and knows that a living being dwells beyond the silence and obscurity noirtier's hair was long and white and flowed over his shoulders while in his eyes shaded by thick black lashes was concentrated as it often happens with an organ which is used to the exclusion of the others all the activity address force and intelligence which were formerly diffused over his whole body and so although the movement of the arm the sound of the voice and the agility of the body were wanting the speaking eye sufficed for all he commanded with it it was the medium through which his thanks were conveyed in short his whole appearance produced on the mind the impression of a corpse with living eyes and nothing could be more startling than to observe the expression of anger or joy suddenly lighting up these organs while the rest of the rigid and marble-like features were utterly deprived of the power of participation three persons only could understand this language of the poor paralytic these were villefort valentine and the old servant of whom we have already spoken but as villefort saw his father but seldom and then only when absolutely obliged and as he never took any pains to please or gratify him when he was there all the old man's happiness was centred in his granddaughter valentine by means of her love her patience and her devotion had learned to read in noirtier's looks all the varied feelings which were passing in his mind to this dumb language which was so unintelligible to others she answered by throwing her whole soul into the expression of her countenance and in this manner were the conversations sustained between the blooming girl and the helpless invalid whose body could scarcely be called a living one but who nevertheless possessed a fund of knowledge and penetration united with a will as powerful as ever although clogged by a body rendered utterly incapable of obeying its impulses valentine had solved the problem and was able easily to understand his thoughts and to convey her own in return and through her untiring and devoted assiduity it was seldom that in the ordinary transactions of everyday life she failed to anticipate the wishes of the living thinking mind or the wants of an almost inanimate body as to the servant he had as we have said been with his master for five and twenty years therefore he knew all his habits and it was seldom that noirtier found it necessary to ask for anything so prompt was he in administering to all the necessities of the invalid villefort did not need the help of either valentine or the domestic in order to carry on with his father the strange conversation which he was about to begin as we have said he perfectly understood the old man's vocabulary and if he did not use it more often it was only indifference and ennui which prevented him from so doing he therefore allowed valentine to go into the garden sent away barois and after having seated himself at his father's right hand while madame de villefort placed herself on the left he addressed him thus i trust you will not be displeased sir that valentine has not come with us or that i dismiss barois for our conference will be one which could not with propriety be carried on in the presence of either madame de villefort and i have a communication to make to you noirtier's face remained perfectly passive during this long preamble while on the contrary villefort's eye was endeavouring to penetrate into the inmost recesses of the old man's heart this communication 
continued the procureur, in that cold and decisive tone which seemed at once to preclude all discussion, will, we are sure, meet with your approbation. The eye of the invalid still retained that vacancy of expression which prevented his son from obtaining any knowledge of the feelings which were passing in his mind. He listened, nothing more. Sir, resumed Villefort, we are thinking of marrying Valentine. Had the old man's face been moulded in wax, it could not have shown less emotion at this news than was now to be traced there. The marriage will take place in less than three months, said Villefort. Noirtier's eyes still retained its inanimate expression. Madame de Villefort now took her part in the conversation and added, We thought this news would possess an interest for you, sir, who have always entertained a great affection for Valentine. It therefore only now remains for us to tell you the name of the young man for whom she is destined. It is one of the most desirable connections which could possibly be formed. He possesses fortune, a high rank in society, and every personal qualification likely to render Valentine supremely happy. His name, moreover, cannot be wholly unknown to you. It is Monsieur Franz de Quesnel, Baron d'Epinay. While his wife was speaking, Villefort had narrowly watched the old man's countenance. When Madame de Villefort pronounced the name of Franz, the pupil of M. Noirtier's eye began to dilate, and his eyelids trembled with the same movement that may be perceived on the lips of an individual about to speak, and he darted a lightning glance at Madame de Villefort and his son. The procureur, who knew the political hatred which had formerly existed between M. Noirtier and the elder d'Epinay, well understood the agitation and anger which the announcement had produced. But, feigning not to perceive either, he immediately resumed the narrative begun by his wife. Sir, said he, you are aware that Valentine is about to enter her nineteenth year, which renders it important that she should lose no time in forming a suitable alliance. Nevertheless, you have not been forgotten in our plans, and we have fully ascertained beforehand that Valentine's future husband will consent not to live in this house, for that might not be pleasant for the young people, but that you should live with them, so that you and Valentine, who are so attached to each other, would not be separated, and you would be able to pursue exactly the same course of life which you have hitherto done, and thus, instead of losing, you will be a gainer by the change, as it will secure you two children instead of one, to watch over and comfort you. Noirtier's look was furious. It was very evident that something desperate was passing in the old man's mind, for a cry of anger and grief rose in his throat, and not being able to find vent in utterance, appeared almost to choke him, for his face and lips turned quite purple with the struggle. Villefort quietly opened a window, saying, It is very warm, and the heat affects Monsieur Noirtier. He then returned to his place, but did not sit down. This marriage, added Madame de Villefort, is quite agreeable to the wishes of Monsieur d'Epinay and his family. Besides, he had no relations nearer than an uncle and aunt, his mother having died at his birth, and his father having been assassinated in 1815, that is to say, when he was but two years old. It naturally followed that the child was permitted to choose his own pursuits, and he has, therefore, seldom acknowledged any other authority but that of his own will. That assassination was a mysterious affair, said Villefort, and the perpetrators have hitherto escaped detection, although suspicion has fallen on the head of more than one person. Noirtier made such an effort that his lips expanded into a smile. Now, continued Villefort, those to whom the guilt really belongs, by whom the crime was committed, on whose heads the justice of man may probably descend here, and the certain judgment of God hereafter, would rejoice in the opportunity thus afforded of bestowing such a peace-offering as Valentine on the son of him whose life they so ruthlessly destroyed. Noirtier had succeeded in mastering his emotion, more than could have been deemed possible with such an enfeebled and shattered frame. Yes, I understand, was the reply contained in his look, and this look expressed a feeling of strong indignation, mixed with profound contempt. Villefort fully understood his father's meaning, and answered by a slight shrug of his shoulders. He then motioned to his wife to take leave. Now, sir, said Madame de Villefort, I must bid you farewell. Would you like me to send Edward to you for a short time? 
it had been agreed that the old man should express his approbation by closing his eyes his refusal by winking them several times and if he had some desire or feelings to express he raised them to heaven if he wanted valentine he closed his right eye only and if barois the left at madame de villefort's proposition he instantly winked his eyes provoked by a complete refusal she bit her lip and said then shall i send valentine to you the old man closed his eyes eagerly thereby intimating that such was his wish monsieur and madame de villefort bowed and left the room giving orders that valentine should be summoned to her grandfather's presence and feeling sure that she would have much to do to restore calmness to the perturbed spirit of the invalid valentine with a color still heightened by emotion entered the room just after her parents had quitted it one look was sufficient to tell her that her grandfather was suffering and that there was much on his mind which he was wishing to communicate to her dear grandpapa cried she what has happened they have vexed you and you are angry the paralytic closed his eyes in token of assent who has displeased you is it my father no madame de villefort no me the former sign was repeated are you displeased with me cried valentine in astonishment m noirtier again closed his eyes and what have i done dear grandpapa that you should be angry with me cried valentine there was no answer and she continued i have not seen you all day has any one been speaking to you against me yes said the old man's look with eagerness let me think a moment i do assure you grandpapa ah monsieur and madame de villefort have just left this room have they not yes and it was they who told you something which made you angry what was it then may i go and ask them that i may have the opportunity of making my peace with you no no said noirtier's look ah you frighten me what can they have said and she again tried to think what it could be ah i know she said lowering her voice and going close to the old man they have been speaking of my marriage have they not yes replied the angry look i understand you are displeased at the silence i have preserved on the subject the reason of it was that they had insisted on my keeping the matter a secret and begged me not to tell you anything of it they did not even acquaint me with their intentions and i only discovered them by chance that is why i have been so reserved with you dear grandpapa pray forgive me but there was no look calculated to reassure her all it seemed to say was it is not only a reserve which afflicts me what is it then asked the young girl perhaps you think i shall abandon you dear grandpapa and that i shall forget you when i am married no they told you then that m d'epinay consented to our all living together yes then why are you still vexed and grieved the old man's eyes beamed with an expression of gentle affection yes i understand said valentine it is because you love me the old man assented and you are afraid i shall be unhappy yes you do not like m franz the eyes repeated several times no 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 then you are vexed with the engagement yes well listen said valentine throwing herself on her knees and putting her arm round her grandfather's neck i am vexed too for i do not love m franz d'epinay an expression of intense joy illuminated the old man's eyes when i wished to retire into a convent you remember how angry you were with me a tear trembled in the eye of the invalid well continued valentine the reason of my proposing it was that i might escape this hateful marriage which drives me to despair noirtier's breathing came thick and short then the idea of this marriage really grieves you too ah if you could but help me if we could both together defeat their plan but you are unable to oppose them you whose mind is so quick and whose will is so firm are nevertheless as weak and unequal to the contest as i am myself alas you who would have been such a powerful protector to me in the days of your health and strength can now only sympathize in my joys and sorrows without being able to take any active part in them however this is much and calls for gratitude and heaven has not taken away all my blessings 
when it leaves me your sympathy and kindness at these words there appeared in noirtier's eyes an expression of such deep meaning that the young girl thought she could read these words there you are mistaken i can still do much for you do you think you can help me dear grandpapa said valentine yes noirtier raised his eyes it was a sign agreed on between him and valentine when he wanted anything what is it you want dear grandpapa said valentine and she endeavoured to recall to mind all the things which he would be likely to need and as the ideas presented themselves to her mind she repeated them aloud then finding that all her efforts elicited nothing but a constant no she said come since this plan does not answer i will have recourse to another she then recited all the letters from the alphabet from a down to n when she arrived at that letter the paralytic made her understand that she had spoken the initial letter of the thing he wanted ah said valentine the thing you desire begins with the letter n it is with n that we have to do then well let me see what can you want that begins with n n a n e n i n o yes 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 said the old man's eye ah it is no then yes valentine fetched a dictionary which she placed on a desk before noirtier she opened it and seeing that the old man's eye was thoroughly fixed on its pages she ran her finger quickly up and down the columns during the six years which had passed since noirtier first fell into this sad state valentine's powers of invention had been too often put to the test not to render her expert in devising expedients for gaining a knowledge of his wishes and the constant practice had so perfected her in the art that she guessed the old man's meaning as quickly as if he himself had been able to seek for what he wanted at the word notary noirtier made a sign for her to stop notary she said do you want a notary dear grandpapa the old man again signified that it was a notary he desired you would wish a notary to be sent for then said valentine yes shall my father be informed of your wish yes do you wish the notary to be sent for immediately yes then they shall go for him directly dear grandpapa is that all you want yes valentine rang the bell and ordered the servant to tell monsieur or madame de villefort that they were requested to come to monsieur noirtier's room are you satisfied now inquired valentine yes i am sure you are it is not very difficult to discover that and the young girl smiled on her grandfather as if he had been a child monsieur de villefort entered followed by barois what do you want me for sir demanded he of the paralytic sir said valentine my grandfather wishes for a notary at this strange and unexpected demand m de villefort and his father exchanged looks yes motioned the latter with a firmness which seemed to declare that with the help of valentine and his old servant who both knew what his wishes were he was quite prepared to maintain the contest do you wish for a notary asked villefort yes what to do noirtier made no answer what do you want with a notary again repeated villefort the invalid's eye remained fixed by which expression he intended to intimate that his resolution was unalterable is it to do us some ill turn do you think it is worth while said villefort still said barois with the freedom and fidelity of an old servant if m noirtier asks for a notary i suppose he really wishes for a notary therefore i shall go at once and fetch one barois acknowledged no master but noirtier and never allowed his desires in any way to be contradicted yes i do want a notary motioned the old man shutting his eye with a look of defiance which seemed to say and i should like to see the person who dares to refuse my request you shall have a notary as you absolutely wish for one sir said villefort but i shall explain to him your state of health and make excuses for you for the scene cannot fail of being a most ridiculous one never mind that said barois i shall go and fetch a notary nevertheless and the old servant departed triumphantly on his mission End of chapter 58